All right, I'm going to get started. I'm uh, Chris Beekler. I'm one of the founders of PFSense. Um, we also have Ermel Lukey here, one of our uh, primary developers, and uh, we have Seth Moss in a box up here come joining us uh, from the Netherlands via Skype. Uh, he did he's done a lot of our IPv6 work, so uh, if uh, any questions or anything come up that I can't answer or aren't entirely sure on, or uh, we've got uh, Seth here to help out as well. Uh, first, a brief background on the project. Um, a lot of times, a lot of users here are already PFSense users and they know about it, but there's always some people who uh, aren't aware of uh, who we are and what we do. Um, we founded the project in 2004, um, and our purpose is to ease deployment and management of BSD firewalls uh, to basically give people the equivalent of a sonic wall, Cisco ASA, et cetera. Uh, without having to manually configure all the uh, various parts of it. And it's much more than just slapping a web interface on top of things. There's a lot of glue underneath that uh, if you were configuring these things manually, you'd have to do custom scripting or things to, to integrate them. And when one thing happens, make sure something else happens and things like that. So there's an excessive amount of logic underneath there that, uh, that ties everything together and uh, makes things easier to, to, uh, to deploy. We have uh, over 120,000 known live installations. Um, our Bogons uh, update for IPv4 fetches uh, once a month, and then we get the, a unique IP count on how many IPs fetch that. And so that way we have some kind of idea of how many systems are out there, uh, how that stacks up to others. Uh, it's pretty significant. It makes it one of the most uh, used firewalls in the world. The, those numbers are kind of hard to find, but uh, we know that you know, that's more than double what um, Staro has and some other, uh, you know, what people may think of as a uh, bigger name, but we're significantly larger than. We have uh, multiple different platforms, um, the live CD and uh, Memstick, uh, and then the, which you can run from if you have a floppy or USB flash drive to save the uh, configuration on. Most people run the full install um, by launching the installer from the live CD or the Memstick. The, uh, the stick is basically the same as the CD, except you can write it out to USB flash drive. So if you have a system that boots off a of USB, that's easier to deal with than, than CDs generally. Uh, and there's a, the Nano BSD version, which is for systems that run from Compact Flash. Um, it's just a customized version of the, the Nano build scripts that keeps things mounted read only uh, most of the time to prevent from killing uh, Compact Flash. And we also have a OVA open appliance, which makes it easy to import into uh, VirtualBox VMware. Uh, most virtualization platforms support uh, OVAs. Some history on the uh, IPv6 development. Seth started it in uh, December 2010 and uh, had the first static configuration done in, uh, in February 2011 and did CARP shortly after that. And we've had uh, some installs in production with real websites behind them. Uh, since April of uh, last year. And then we had uh, DHCP, PD, uh, 6.4, 6RD, a lot of the other uh, tunneling and, and WAN types uh, recently. And we're pretty much feature complete for what we're going to have for a 2.1 release. The, the things that are required for the mass, vast majority of elements uh, are, are there and, and functional. And we've had uh, every website that we host out of our uh, primary data center, which is Pretty much all of them, with the exception of mirrors, is uh, dual stack for at least six months, and some of them for close to a year now. So, no, a basic overview of IPv6. We don't really have time to get into it. If you uh, don't have a whole lot of background on it, hopefully you went to the IPv6 tutorial uh, here earlier this week. Uh, but just some uh, basics from the perspective of uh, what's relevant to firewalls. Uh, the two different kinds of connectivity, native or, or tunneled, uh, most people at this point, um, at least in North America for sure, are um, using tunneled rather than uh, native, where you're tunneling your V6 over V4 out to some kind of uh, tunnel broker or uh, sometimes a, a service provided by your ISP. Um, where native is, you actually have V6 delivered without having to tunnel it within uh, IPv4, which is Pretty uncommon at this point, at least uh, in North America. It's becoming more common in other parts of the world. 
there's a number of different tunnel providers uh, that you can use. There's a long list of them. Most people uh, use Hurricane Electric from, from uh, what we've seen. And by and large, IPv6 is pretty similar to IPv4. It's only different at layer two and layer three. If you're doing HTTP over IPv6, it's still HTTP inside of the uh, uh, traffic. It's just the, rather than ARP, you have NDP, and then uh, at layer three, you have IPv6 instead of IPv4. And 128-bit address space is um, not exactly 128-bit address space. The, the leftmost 64 bits are the, the networks that are available, and then the, uh, the right 64 bits are the, the host addresses. And generally, you always use the, the slash 64 uh, subnets, things like stateless auto configuration can work. So this has been, IPv6 has been coming for a long time now. If you, uh, I found a, an article from PC World in uh, 2003 that uh, they said that IPv6 would replace the current IPv4 for nearly all internet traffic by 2008. And it's now 2012 and we're still less than 1%. But uh, it, it really is starting to come now because we've uh, done pretty much all we can to extend the life of v4, VLSM and NAT and whatnot. Uh, it's, we're very, very close to being entirely out of IPs and that's the point where it's uh, starting to happen. And some stats from um, AMSIX, the big internet exchange in Amsterdam. Uh, they peak at about one and a half terabits per second of V4, and two and a half gigabits per second of V6. It's a <laughs> they have, yeah, they have much less on other ones. That's that's one of the higher utilized IPv6. So that's almost percent. That's far higher than uh, than what most of them actually see. Yeah, it really is coming now. This is from our primary hosting network. Uh, for April 2012, the, the traffic that we pushed, 68.2 gig of uh, V6 and 1.1 terabytes of V4. So we actually, almost 6% of our traffic was IPv6. So that's gone up from about 1% six months ago. So that's, uh, we've seen it grow pretty significantly, but our user base is far from the average uh, end user. Our Internet Explorer percentage usage is like 20% or something. And, only like 60% of people run Windows who visit our sites. So we don't exactly have a, a the general public visiting, but uh, we've seen great growth in, uh, in V6 over the past few months. So the uh, security considerations with IPv6, you know, largely the same because you're really running the same stuff just with a different protocol. And the, all your risks with HTTP and HTTPS, SMTP, whatever protocols that you use, it's all the same stuff, it's just a different uh, transport that they're going over. One major difference is with firewall rules, because uh, NAT is hopefully a thing of the past, um, in, a, in a lot of scenarios at least. Uh, with your typical IPv4 firewall, if you throw in an allow all rule on WAN, you're really just allowing all traffic to your outside interface of your firewall. You do that with IPv6 and you're opening your entire LAN up. So you gotta make sure not to, to add excessively permissive uh, rules because you can open up a whole lot more than generally what you can with uh, V4 and NAT unless you're using a lot of one NAT. Uh, and then some of the other um, attacks and things are the same nature as the ones in, I, in IPv4 but just uh, different because of the functionality um, in IPv6. So the ARP-related attacks would be for now NDP-related. The uh, V6 WAN types that we support, um, static, just with V4, you just put in your IP and your gateway. Um, DHCP V6, which is to some extent like DHCP and V4, but not exactly because it adds prefix delegation, which is where whenever you get a lease on your WAN, you also get uh, the prefix or multiple fixes that you use on your internal network. And then your firewall or whatever edge device that you have uh, takes those prefixes that are delegated in the PD and assigns that to your uh, internal interface. Same with uh, PPPoE. We do support uh, stateless auto configuration um, as a WAN type. You're probably not going to see any ISPs that use that that way. That's 
for uh, appliance type deployments that, that people use if they put out a, a system that is for a certain special purpose, uh, then they can uh, get their address via uh, auto configuration. Uh, six and four is a uh, gift tunneling. It's what you use for like Hurricane Electric uh, tunnel broker and uh, similar services. Uh, six to four is another type that some uh, SPs are deploying. It also has prefix delegation and uh, same with 6RD. And that covers most of the WANs that are out there. Um, PPTP type WANs are not very common overall. They are available in some parts of the world. We don't have uh, V6 support for those yet. These are the few things that are, we're going to release 2.1 without having IPv6 support on. Uh, Capture Portal is a big one, and that's really a, kind of a difficult one to, uh, to do. It's, I'm not aware of any Captive Portal implementation that has IPv6 support. There may be some out there, but the main challenge being you want to authenticate v4 and v6 at the same time, and that requires a lot of work to figure out what the v4 IP is, what the v6 IP is, and authenticate both of those. Otherwise, you end up with somebody going to a v4 website, they authenticate and pay, or uh, whatever process you have to get through the Captive Portal, and then they go to a v6 site, and it's the same thing all over again. And some of the larger uh, hotel internet providers and similar that we work with have not really cared about v6 to this point and don't see it in the foreseeable future. So it's uh, one that we're pushing off for the time being. Um, Dynamic DNS, we don't have support there because pretty much no provider actually has support for uh, uh, quad A records in Dynamic DNS. Um, we'll probably come with time, but it. Thing, things there will probably change from where you're not just registering your firewall and then getting to it from the outside, but because clients will have public IPs on them, they may run their own dynamic DNS client, register themselves that way. And the PPPoE and PPTP uh, work with MP that requires a pretty significant amount of work to, to get those going, so, uh, pushing those off to a, a future release as well. If you're interested in helping with any of those, we'd be uh, glad to have the help. Okay, I'm going to go through, um, just walk through some of these screens and uh, how to uh, configure things for uh, V6. the times fire just update Interfaces, we've added a, a separate section where you choose what type of IPv6 configuration that you're putting on that interface. Uh, you can set it to none, to disable v6 on there, um, select IPv6, and then it goes uh, up a box down here where you can enter your static IP, ask in the gateway if you have one, if it's a, an internet connection, you have a gateway. Uh, DHCP6, and then name option and uh, it also has uh, the prefix delegation size. Uh, slack for uh, stateless auto configuration. 6RD tunnel if it's uh, going to be taking out, 6 to 4, similar. And then interface is if it's, uh, you would do this like LAN if you had DHCP6 or anything else with prefix delegation. Uh, then your LAN you'd set to track interface, and uh, you pick the interface that has your dynamic uh, IPv6 connection on it. Since I don't have any on the system, there's none here. Uh, you choose which prefix ID that you actually want to use on this interface. You automatically assign 
uh, just colon colon one as the IP uh, appending to that prefix that, you're, uh, that you choose the ID of here. You would do static in, in that case. Uh, whenever you get uh, a tunnel, you would go to uh, get interface and assign. And then you can set up your GIF tunnel here. And then you put in uh, their V4 IP, and uh, then you have your, your V6 IPs uh, here with the two. And then once you actually set up the, the tunnel, uh, then they route you uh, either a slash 64 or you can get a slash 48 from them as well. And then you just configure your LAN static out of the 64 or the 48 that they assign you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's how we're running uh, most of our networks now. Uh, one of the approaches that some users are taking is to split V6 into an entirely separate Firewall, so you have v4 going out one way and v6 out the other. Uh, that's a little less practical if you're, uh, unless you have native v6. Um, that's we've been doing on a lot of our networks more because we tend to break our own systems more than you would ever break a, a system that somebody wasn't developing on actively. And firewall rules have. Uh, Choice of protocol, either four or V six. And the fields uh update accordingly so you can uh, appropriate mask and and under NAT we have a uh, network prefix translation, which is Particularly like one to one NAT, more or less, in uh, IPv4. Uh, if you're using ULA addressing on your internal network, which is the V6 equivalent of private IPs, uh, RFC 1918, then you can uh, do a translation to uh, your internet. And it's also, at least at this point, the best small networks. If you're not big enough to have a, your own AS and uh, your own direct allocation, uh, then you pretty much have to do prefix translation if you don't want to do that on at least one of your uh, internet connections. So it, it's coming from uh, IP space on that ISP. And people really, really want to get rid of uh, NAT with V6. And those who are not big fans of uh, network prefix translation, but really it's the only multi-homing solution for, for small networks at this point. It's a one-to-one -one translation, so if you have slash 64 internally, it has to be a slash 64 externally. Yeah, not really. Leave the input translation that prevents you from setting up anything different from that. Why? Why would you give Mary on mine? You would actually want to do that. <laughs> By default, we do not NAT uh, IPv6. We set up NAT by default for v4 on any interface that has a gateway. Traffic leaving that uh, interface gets NAT to that interface as IP, the default outbound. Uh, with IPv6, there is no no NAT by default. There's the TPv6 server. Uh, that's also where, at the moment at least, we have uh, the router advertisement option to be configured. I think we may end up moving that to the interfaces page because um, it's not, it really has no relation to DHCPv6. It would seem like a some place to put it, logical, decent place. To, at the time, it's probably more sensible on the interfaces page. So you, if you disable it, then there's no router advertisements on that uh, network. If you do router only, then it's 
only router advertisements. Um, unmanaged is uh, router advertisements plus stateless auto configuration. And uh, managed is uh, IP assignment through DHCP v6, but it does do uh, router ad advertisements. And uh, it's uh, uh, DHCP and stateless uh, auto configuration. Usually you would uh, at least do managed, managed or assisted or only is um, not exceptionally common. And we have the uh, EP table similar to the uh, ARP table, which has uh, the NDP cache of the, of the system there. And the packet catcher has uh, the ability to pick uh, V4 or V6 only as well. That's the bulk of the uh, the V6 areas. Uh, on the other screens, anywhere where an IP can be configured, it's uh, been updated to, to do V4 or V6 as well. Uh, other features in um, 2.1, we switched our package system out to use uh, PBIs, the uh, push button installer uh, packages uh, created by PCBSD. Uh, benefit of those is they're entirely self-contained, so they have all their libraries and dependencies and everything else are entirely contained within that package. So you don't have to worry about any kind of libraries if one package wants one version of this and a different one requires some different version. Um, it, they each have their own and uh, they can't stomp each other. Um, there are, the packages are largely developed by uh, people other than our core development team and they aren't necessarily as uh, well tested, especially for interoperability with other particular packages um, as the base system itself is. And you can get into scenarios depending on which package you have installed where one uh, has conflicts with another one and that, uh, or you uninstall one and it blows away dependencies of another one. And PBIs uh, were designed really to get rid of all of that. And that's uh, why we changed our, our package system over to use that. It gets rid of a lot of... Uh, applications that, uh, that you can have with, with packages. Student package bad on uh, FreeBSD. And we upgraded to uh, FreeBSD 8.3 base. We initially were trying 9.0, but that uh, we wanted to get it out pretty quickly. And there were a number of things that we used, that a variety of uh, issues in 9.0. Uh, so we stuck with 8.3, and uh, it's been Pretty good so far. Uh, just a couple minor issues we need to get resolved and we're pretty close to, to release. Uh, we added multi-instance captive pools. So uh, in previous versions, you could pick multiple interfaces and then uh, figure it, but you could only have one instance of the captive portal, so one set of settings. And now you can define however many instances you want. So if you want one to have just a click through, I agree to the terms. Uh, another one has authentication. Uh, there's a, another one that uses vouchers. You can flexibility in what you can do with that. And we also finally finished up the uh, internationalization, which was started in 2.0 that was uh, finished um, for the most part, where uh, we have a, a couple of translations that are work in progress. Portuguese is uh, much done, and um, French is better than half done, I believe. They're, they're making pretty good progress on them. The languages we're actually going to end up having it. In, in the release, uh, maybe just a couple initially, but I think with time that'll, that'll grow significantly. So uh, our plan is uh, moving forward, but we uh, got one and um, further versions from there. Uh, we made shorter release cycles but, uh, than what we did between 1.2.3 and, uh, and 2.0 just because of the huge number of changes that uh, that went in. Uh, keeping things smaller and trying to release roughly every six months if we can. Um, kind of depends on what uh, 
FreeBSD's release schedule look like and what functionality that we're adding and uh, when we can get finished. Um, hope to already have 2.1 done by now, but the, a lot of the IPv6 stuff required a lot more work than we expected. It's the, uh, it was much more than just configuring those things. A lot of those things don't actually properly support v6. So we've had uh, changed a lot of things in the underlying um, binaries and uh, a lot more effort there than what we had anticipated. Uh, the 2.2 release, um, roughly early 2013, uh, it'll be based on FreeBSD 9. Uh, exactly which version kind of depends on um, their release schedule. 1, 9.2 um, depends on what they have uh, out at that point. The bulk of the stuff that we've been working on the, the last few months, aside from uh, V6 and the other things that I talked about, is a, a lot of captive portal features. Um, we're, we have uh, several rebranded versions that um, some good sized hotel and internet providers use. And, We've got thousands of uh, rooms that are already uh, behind the existing captive portal. And the, uh, the new functionality that we're working on will uh, pretty much be competitive with any, any product out there. Uh, we'll have service class support where you can find uh, internet packages that are available for purchase, their cost, what speed you get, the duration, uh, processing is built in. Um, a lot of various features that have been extended and added and we can get all that merged into the open source side for uh, 2.2. There are uh, a lot of uh, great changes there. We got uh, snapshots at snapshots.pfsense.org if you want to check it out. And thanks for attending. Questions? Yeah, we've been running at production for a year now. Yeah, just re repeating the question for the sake of the uh, asked if the 2.1 snapshots are like most of our uh, beta releases and that they're very, very solid. And yeah, and a lot of uh, people have been running our beta snapshots in production. There is always some risk in grabbing some arbitrary snapshot. I don't know if it you know, caught some commit that shouldn't have been made or caught half of something or something like that. So before you actually upgrade a, a system, it's always, I always just run a VM through a, an upgrade. And as long as it comes back up and uh, functions, then I'll upgrade our systems. Uh, <laughs> Generally better to post to the former mailing list first um, to get you know, confirmation. But if you if it's very clear, you know, we just have issues of people support us into the bug tracker, and that just gets out of hand. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if you have something that's clearly a legit bug report, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. The question is, if we are uh, considering adding more things along the lines of like a wizard or something like that for some of the functionality that takes several steps to set up, we did add a, an open VPN wizard in uh, in two for uh, to go through and set up like a remote access server, and it it generates you can generate the CA certificate, the server certificate, uh, specify uh, all the configuration parameters, and then uh, once you get to the end, I mean, it's just a few clicks. It's like five minutes to set up now. And it does, yeah, it's checkboxes at the end. Do you want to allow the firewall the rules to allow traffic to the server and then allow uh, traffic from within the VPN? Uh, yeah, it's. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so what are some, uh, right now, I'm just, I implemented last week um, on my box uh, at the weekend. What um, are the ways that we can address, because I'm not sure what the default firewall rules do you suggest? Yeah, the question is, uh, what default firewall rules do you suggest on IPv6? It, Depends on what you're doing. I mean, generally, most people would kind of take the same methodology as they do with v4. Or bad, they allow everything out and block everything in. Um, I would put more restrictive egress filtering on, so you're not just allowing anything out to the internet. But on some networks, that's I mean, people just don't care. They'll, they'll let anything they want out. If you're doing a if you're doing a uh, like a GIF, in that case, you your ingress traffic from the internet will be filtered on the GIF, and your egress traffic will be on your LAN or whatever internal interface that your clients are on. So it's the the same as before in that regard. Basically, wherever the IP, wherever that traffic is coming in, is where you put your rules. And in the case of tunneling, it, it's coming in on the on the actual GIF. Uh, the question was, are there other things that don't work in IPv6? Um, just the few things that I listed on that slide, um, you know, in a captive portal network, it's just going to block all IPv6. Uh, in scenarios, I mean, there's nothing else that would cause any issues that I can, that I can think of. You know, the, maybe some of the packages, like uh, bandwidth D, I'm not sure if it, you know, reports on IPv6 for an IPv6 both, it, uh, it might. Uh, but for the most part, there's not a lot of things that aren't uh, equivalent at this point. So, Mike? I have, Dynamic DNS, I, I mentioned. The, the, the providers don't support quad A's at this point. So we can support it, don't support it. It'll be kind of different uh, in how it's implemented, probably, because public are directly assigned to clients rather than updating your firewall's IP, which you may want to, to do if you want to get there to manage the firewall. But uh, what a lot of people use Dynamic DNS for is to get to something on an internal host. In that case, you're probably going to be running that Dynamic DNS client on the internal host, so it updates its own key. Yeah. The question is, uh, Bjorn was talking last year about how whenever he had IPv6 only, uh, he found a lot of issues in underlying apps. And is the situation as bad now um, as what it was a year ago? In some instances, yes. Um, in others, not so much. Um, like OpenVPN still does not support IPv6 in any stable place. Uh, we've been working with them to try to get them up to speed. And there's been a number of other underlying pieces like that that are missing support or have issues or, or things like that, um, a lot of which we've gotten resolved, uh, and some of which you know, may not get resolved immediately. But um, I think things have improved some there as it's starting to get more attention from people. Um, World IPv6 Day last year, and, uh, stuff like Bjorn was doing with IPv6 only, um, FreeBSD builds and things like that have uh, gotten a lot more attention on it. And I, you know, things are improving, but I don't know that it's improving at a. It is improving at a decent at a decent pace, but there are still issues. A uh, question: or the way to uh, configure the DNS resolver to prefer uh, v6 or v4 or vice versa, even uh, the DNS resolver itself. I mean, that's that's dependent on your source OS whatever is initiating the uh, DNS requests. So 
um, in, in, in FreeBSD, if you, yeah, I mean, there is a, there's a sys control for it. I don't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but yeah, you can tell it to for 4 over V6. Uh, it's, it prefers V6 by default. So what the, what OSs generally do, um, all of them from what I've seen, at least there are at least OS 10 and Windows and uh, FreeBSD and Linux, they'll send a, an A and a quad A at the time and they'll prefer the quad A if they get a response to Questions are, are there issues with AP on uh, V6 as there are on uh, V4? It's the, it's the same disaster, and it should have died 20 years ago, and it just keeps living on. So just stop using FTP. Do us all a favor. Actually, our FTP proxy does not even do anything with V6 at this point. So um, anything that you're having to do with FTP on V6 that requires a proxy is just not going to work at all. Uh, but passive. Passive mode doesn't require a proxy, and pretty much everything defaults to passive anymore, except Windows command line client. The client on Earth defaults to uh, passive, which uh, which works and doesn't cause so many issues. Multiple one. Where the box initiates its own RAs, or We don't uh, we don't use FreeBSDs um, to send router advertisements. We use a RA what the heck is it called RA TVD or something like that. It's just a user LAN process that actually sends the request and then we turn it off within uh, FreeBSD because that lets us do things that FreeBSD didn't let us do, like send RAs on uh, on car keys, um, things like that. So that that's how we've gotten around some of the issues inherent in uh, in FreeBSD with R. I'm not sure if that covers the entirety of uh, what you're wondering about or there is at this point no, the mastering git is a uh, is still 2.1 there's nothing uh, there's nothing newer than that Ours is different from freeze. Um, we have divert sockets. We have um, a number of things back from newer versions. Um, <coughs> it doesn't exactly match up to any other PF anywhere. So it's, uh, it's hard to say exactly what uh, version it is. Yeah, it's a bit back. It's, it's before the syntax change. Uh, 
the, the PPTP server is one of the ones that does not have v6 support because the underlying MPD um, does not. Okay. So, so that's good for yeah, it's yeah. Always been native to v4, so. Yeah, that's yeah. It hasn't changed for v4. Uh, it's just v6 we're going to have to implement, um, and it's more than we can get done for for this release, but. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we will eventually yeah, get it uh, yeah, it's, implemented. It's one of the killer uh, yeah. Is that Windows instead of Word? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> PC speaker, yeah, I, yeah, it didn't seem all that useful initially, but <laughs> people liked it and wanted it and begged for it, and we put it in there. And some people actually go out and they they make their own song that's something different, and they upload something to it, so it plays some different song. Oh man, you people got too much time on your hands, but. <laughs> There were the AC, some, uh, yeah, I don't think that's an issue. They, they had BIOS updates for those platforms because the clock was just really weird. Uh, there was some kind of ACPI bug in the BIOS on some of those that it would stretch it out instead of just a little beep, it would beep for like eight seconds on each beep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I didn't show the RRDs. The RRDs actually split out. Oh, I showed RRDs, but um, so like for the traffic graph, yeah. it splits out uh, V4 and V6. Mm -hmm. This doesn't have much of anything on it, but I think the... Uh, The slide that I had that has our real RDs on it is probably a better. No, I trimmed it off because they wouldn't, they wouldn't fit on the screen. Same graph. At the bottom here, it shows IPv4, in pass, out pass, in block, out block, and then v6 are all the same. Uh, Ooh, it turns off all the lights, doesn't it? Yeah, there are colors. I mean, you can't really tell on this graph because it's not really pushing any traffic, but maybe I can. <laughs> I think it's more distinguished. Look you. I can't get my VPN client to show up because my screen's too small. Yeah. Can you, can you talk a little bit about, about venting uh, with respect to packets per second uh, compared to San Francisco? Yeah, and we've, it's been a bit since I've tested Cisco, but I know that some of our um, resellers have been, have been doing so. Uh, and if you just take the, the stated numbers that they put out there and believe them, then uh, their, uh, yeah, whether or not those have any basis in reality is uh, questionable, but the um, pretty much the highest in server hardware that you can get now will um, stand up to DDoS attacks that are as as big as what you know, all but the very highest end ASA will, which is about a hundred fifty thousand dollar box. So, you know, for a, a two thousand dollar server to to 
compared to basically everything except once you get up into six figures on commercial firewalls is, is pretty solid. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we've actually made some changes to in 2.1 to reduce memory usage on those platforms by uh, lowering the number of web interface processes and things like that, so it chews up a bit less RAM on the small hardware. No, no, it's it's the same as uh, the packages on embedded are the same as on uh, full. They have been since two. Yeah. Yeah, and they they all they function the same for you know things that are embedded suitable. So you know, some of the packages that are storing large amounts of data and require a a read write mounted partition are not there, but that's. Only a small number of them, but the vast majority of them are there. Yeah. What, do you want to make a file server out of your firewall, too? God, too many people want to do that. <laughs> They're stored in a RAM disk, um, and there is a setting to, um, it's not on this because this is not, uh, there's a setting to write it to the CF periodically. So you can set it you know, twice a day to write it out to the CF. Uh, anytime you reboot the system, it, it writes it out as well before it reboots. So, it you do have a if you lose power, you are you are going to lose some RRD data. Uh, how much just depends on uh, how how frequently you have it set to write out the CF. You were For like an ISP? Yeah, or say you just have a you have a bunch of bandwidth and you you decided you're playing a hundred you got you've got a ninety six set out you can do that. That's generally what people use NetFlow for. Okay. Yeah, you can just uh, export NetFlow to a, a collector and then you generally do your, your billing or, or accounting or have you from that. Um, or some people use the PPOE server and do radius accounting um, from that. And others do, uh, some LISPs actually do use Captive Portal for uh, their customers. Uh, they use the radius authentication and do the accounting through that. From what I've heard with the underlying MPB, you can do thousands of simultaneous sessions. Um, ours, what is it limited to? I think it's 256 is the most the GUI lets you configure. So <coughs> short of hacking it up to uh, support more than that, the, the limit that we have in there. Yeah. Or no, is it still MPD4? We do still have, we still do have both, yeah, because of the interface renaming, I believe, is what the issue is on some of them. Yeah, yeah, that's right, it is four, yeah. No, it, it's not, I don't know if it's twice as much, but it's not, uh, it's not significantly greater overhead. Mm -hmm. I don't know about lots. Uh, I mean, there are 10 that I know of offhand, which generally means there's 30 times that many that I'm not aware of. Uh, it's not one of our most widely used features, but uh, it is reasonably widely used. That's another one where uh, MPD and uh, some of the other pieces need some help. So that's one of the items that we're skipping V6 support on for, for 2.1 at least. And we'll uh, address that if we can.
in the future. Mm. Well, as a client, the PPPoE is supported. It's just the server part, uh, part that requires a lot of uh, work to get that to, to function. It does, but there's a number of uh, complications on uh, other pieces that are required to make it all work. <laughs> really? You know what? The Cisco hardware does not. A Cisco ASA is a PC in a very expensive box that has a Cisco label on it. Yeah, the new the X is yeah the the absolute top of the line one hundred fifty thousand dollar box has some hardware acceleration in it. <laughs> no, sorry, I have the budget for that, sorry. <laughs> And there are, you know, consultants who will say, oh, yeah, you know, you need this, you know, Cisco box or whatever vendor is paying them the, the most to push their particular product. And, uh, you know, depending on who you're talking to, it can be very, very hard to convince them. It, it, it's true of any kind of open source. You know, oh, this guy is want to run their, you know, Windows server and they don't want to use FreeBSD or whatever. Uh, and it's, it's no different in the firewall world than it is anywhere else. Yeah, yeah. Uh, HACOM does on their site um, <clears throat> some specific numbers. They have uh, a few ASAs, and they've run the exact same test through the ASA and through PFSense on this particular piece of hardware. And they, you know, line it up and show you um, what they're doing. I don't know that Cisco is so bad with um, suing anybody who even thinks about putting out performance benchmarks as what some other companies are. Some of them you just can't do it at all. But I know that Acom's been doing that for years, and they've never, as far as I know, had any trouble um, with it. And I know others have done, uh, have done similar things, so I don't think that's much of an issue. Yeah. What is the minimum hardware uh, to be able to do it? It depends on your NICs, and it depends on the uh, just the packet size and the, the system in general. Um, you know, at, at a typical distribution, which is more skewed towards larger packet sizes, um, I've seen some Atom platforms that can push a gig wire speed. Um, some of the, the faster ones that have Intel NICs in them, or you know, anything but Realtek. Uh, <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, it's not too hard to find stuff that'll push gig wire speed if you're getting <laughs> new hardware, at least, unless you're just going at the very low end, like an Alex or, or something like that. And even a re four generation old server at this point will we'll do that. <coughs> it's possibly dependent on bus speed at that point, as long as you got a PCI bus, cause, or PCI X, because uh, you're trying to push uh, gigabit speed through a PCI bus, that's probably not going to happen. Yeah, that's what. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, if we have Yeah. No, not just for byte, no. <laughs> yeah, it's Except when they're measuring packets per second, then they do 64 bytes because then that makes them look better. Even if you, even if very high DDoS attacks, if you're blocking the traffic, PF behaves very well whenever you're blocking it. It's, but in any firewall for that matter, and some of them are not quite as good, but you know, what kills you with a firewall is the number of new state insertions per second. And when you're getting hit with the sin flood or something like that, and it's trying to open up all those states, it just melts down. <laughs> I was just doing some testing recently for one of our customers and just doing a, the biggest sin flows I could get. I was locking up pretty much everything I could get. Uh, OpenBSD started dropping stuff. It, it's, its existing session stayed active. It was the only OS, OpenBSD was the only OS where under a massive sin flood, the existing connections were functional, but you couldn't open any new connections, so you were more or less in the water unless you were already SSH in the box. But. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it just it, it starts dropping traffic once the IP input queue gets full, unless it's a part of an active connection, which is actually pretty nice. But it's far more involved than that, and we don't have we don't have an hour and a half to yeah. Yeah. Is that in five dot one? Yeah, that's what I was testing. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I was testing on a PowerEdge 2950 dual socket quad core, uh, 16 gigs of RAM. Depends on the NIC. Some of them do, yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, they are. Uh, some of them are loader.conf settings.